to buy AMP or not to buy AMP? That is the question. Movies, oh, oh. music. Hello everybody and welcome. Hello. My name is Elon Osborne and this is my YouTube channel where I talk about movies, audio, and music. And today I'll be discussing a feature that you may have come across in your receiver's manual that made you think WTF is bi-amping. Well, let's dive in. Set up. First off, and most importantly, in order to even think about possibly bi-amping, you need a pair of speakers that have two sets of binding posts. Typically, your speaker will only have one set consisting of a positive and negative terminal. If this is you, you're more than welcome to keep watching if you want, but this doesn't apply to you. <laughs> Sorry. But if you do see two sets, then you're in luck, my friend, because you might be able to bi-amp. Stay tuned to see if the rest of your setup allows for this option. Today's Biamping video features the Aperion Audio Veris 3 Grand V5B bookshelf speakers. Check out the unboxing and review videos if they've piqued your interest. But as you can see, there are gold-plated spade connector jumper cables attached to the binding posts. This allows you to use these speakers as you would with any other speaker, only needing to plug speaker wire into one set since the tweeter and the woofer are connected to each other via this jumper cable. But before we move on, we need to double check to see if our AV receiver even has a bi-amp option. So just a quick recap. Step one, make sure you have a pair of speakers with two sets of binding posts. Step two, go into your AV receiver software and see if it even supports bi-amp. For this step, I'll be using my nine channel Morantz SR7015 AV receiver. The software in Morantz and Denon are identical, so feel free to follow along if you have either brand. Or even if you don't, the gist is still the same to check your speaker configuration options and see if there is one that includes bi-amping in the title. So in the Morantz setup menu, go to speakers, manual setup, amp assign. Right at the top under assign mode, as we scroll to the right or the left, we can see the many different options. Eventually you'll run into two biamping options, 5.1 channel biamp plus zone 2 and 7.1 channel biamp, since this is a 9 channel receiver. If you have a 7 channel receiver, you'll only be able to do 5.1 channel biamp since biamping requires the use of two additional terminals. Or if you had an 11 channel receiver, you could pull off a 7.1 channel biamp plus zone two, etc. I suggest going into your receiver and checking it out firsthand. I'm gonna be real honest with you before continuing on this topic. If you have a seven channel receiver that you paid around $1,000 or less, even if it has the bi-amping option, it's most likely not even worth it. When Atmos came along and the need for more channels became a necessity, the overall power of receivers went down significantly, especially when driving all seven or all nine channels in a home theater setting. So, since it don't make them like they used to, the only time you might actually benefit from bi-amping is if you have a flagship receiver, like the Marantz SR8015 or Denon X8500H because then you have some significant power being allocated to those bi-amp speakers. And that's when you'll really start to notice a difference. Even with my Marantz SR7015, it's probably still not the best. And I'll get more into that when I talk about what I heard with my own ears. Just a fair warning, since I don't wanna trick you into thinking this is even something you'll want to invest in unless you're willing to spend a huge chunk of change. So. Shall we keep going? Yes. Okay then, back in the setup menu under amp assign, we're gonna focus on 5.1 channel by amp plus zone two. Just a good old fashioned 5.1 configuration with some by amped front left and right speakers, which are represented in the graphic here as BI-A. If we scroll down to view speaker config and press enter, we now see that the front left and right speaker terminals are ready for bi-amping, along with the height one speaker terminals. Again, this might differ in your setup depending on how many channels your receiver has. Now, if we look at the manual for a second, we can see that it specifically says to use the front left and right terminals on the back to power the tweeters or high frequencies and to use the height one terminals to power the woofers or low frequencies. But honestly, you could technically switch that assignment and be okay. But we're just gonna go ahead and follow the manual for this demonstration. So just a friendly reminder to make sure your jumper has been removed, plug your speaker wires into your right front upper speaker terminals and plug the other end into the right front terminals on the back. Plug into the left 
front upper speaker terminals and plug the other end into the left front terminals on the back. Now plug into the right front lower speaker terminals and plug the other end into the right height one terminals on the back. Last but not least, plug into the left front lower speaker terminals and then plug the other end into the left height one terminals on the back. Now you should be good to go and ready to get your bi amp on, yo. So now you're thinking, how do they sound? Well, I mentioned this in the review of the Varus bookshelf speakers, but in a 5.1 home theater setting, there really wasn't much of a difference. With there being a center channel dealing with most of the dialogue, along with surround speakers enveloping the soundstage all around you, any fine details that biamping added was kind of masked or not too noticeable with three other speakers blaring at me. But as I stated earlier, it might also be the fact that the SR7015 still doesn't quite cut it as far as the immense power needed to truly get a fantastic biamping experience. Or it could be that I'm testing it out on bookshelf speakers. In doing my research, some claim that biamping bookshelf speakers is generally a waste. It's not unless you're biamping some serious tower speakers with dual bass woofers, maybe even some mid-range woofers and a tweeter that you'll really start to hear any difference with biamping. And even when I pared down my setup to watching movies and TV using just the bookshelf speakers, eh. again, it made such a subtle difference that I don't think it was worth the hassle or the fact that I used up two more speaker terminals that I could have powered some height speakers, for example. But what I did notice is the difference when I listened to music. But again, only when I was listening to just the two bookshelf speakers. But let's get one thing straight. Biamping doesn't mean it makes it twice as loud. No. It just made those finer details come alive more. Guitar strumming, finger plucking, hi-hats cutting through the mix, a more articulate bass response, just a cleaner audio signal, not louder. I personally find biamping more suitable in a hi-fi setup anyway versus a home theater setup, or at least when you're listening to music on your home theater speakers, like how my Marantz will automatically reduce my setup to play through just my front left and right speakers when streaming music. So in that instance, it is nice to have biamping already configured within the receiver, ready to go when I decide to stream music. Like when I went down memory lane for this test and played a bunch of Tool. I mean, the clarity of the toms, the kick of the drum kit, Maynard's vocals cutting through the mix, the guitars enveloping my head, the bass guitar having its own place in the mix with so much body to its sound. It was incredible. In fact, Biamping made songs from their first album, like their hit Sober, sound clearly dated compared to their newest album, Fear and Oculum, that dropped in 2019, with such incredible advancements in the recording arts that have been made since 1993, they made Undertow sound amateur. I still love it, but man, Tool has come a long way sonically, and it sounds awesome when biamped. Recap. All right, so basically just remember these things if you want to get into biamping. One. Make sure your speakers have two sets of binding posts. Two. Make sure your receiver can support biamping. Three. Even if your receiver can support it, you might not even hear a difference unless you're dealing with some serious power distribution, like with a flagship receiver. Four. And even then, it's really going to make a difference when listening to music. Bottom line is, if you're thinking about investing in speakers and expensive flagship receivers solely for the purpose of biamping, don't. It's not worth it. But if you already have a powerful receiver or just happen to notice that a pair of your speakers has two sets of binding posts and you want to experiment with biamping, by all means, go for it. Would I personally use biamping? I guess I could if I wanted to have a cool 5.2.2 setup with biamp front speakers, but honestly, I'd rather have more height channels or more speakers surrounding me since I listen to music on my home theater system less than half the time I watch movies or TV on it. But I might change my tune once I get my hands on some big old tower speakers that can be biamped, so stay tuned for that. And there you have it. Thank you for taking this journey with me into biamping. Is it something you'll at least experiment with? Do you own any speakers that can be biamped and wondered what those extra binding posts were for? Do you swear by it and wish I was more enthusiastic about it? Let me know in the comments below. As always, be kind to each other out there. Don't just watch TV and movies, experience them. And of course, always be listening.